uh, is uh, kind of, I mean, I don't, I don't have very much time. And usually what I we do with the material that I, I talk about here is something that either I do in five days time with eight hours a day, <laughs> or I, I'm, I'm rolling this out as a, as a semester class um, this spring. And so that's, you know, maybe a couple hours of lecture every day, every other, every week, I should say. So I, I kind of condensed it down. Um, Kimberly and I have talked a little bit. There's a, a model that everybody usually is pretty familiar with, um, Kubler-Ross's model. And, and actually, that used to be the gold standard when it comes to grief and loss. It isn't anymore. Um, and so <clears throat> right now, kind of the gold standard is more in terms of um, something called the tier model. And, and the long, more I've talked about with people, and, and my, I mean, my background, maybe I should tell you a little bit about that. I, I've been at CCU 11 years. I've been in private practice for 30. Um, and uh, back in 93, I wrote a book called Grieving the Loss of Someone You Love, and then we did a second edition um, in the 2000s, and I lose track of where it is in the 2000s, but, um, and, and um, so I've, I've had a fair amount of op opportunity to kind of talk with folks over the years with, with mourning and, and grief and everything else, and kind of watch, I mean, a lot of cases I end up interacting with people that that the church stumbles to take care of, right? It, it, it has a love-hate relationship with death. <laughs> uh, on the one hand, we know that it's a beginning, but then on the other hand, it, it's an ending. And, and so how do we help people kind of do that? So what I thought I'd do is, is um, kind of introduce you to something that I call from morning to morning. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the thing, there are some kind of realities that I want to start with. The, the first one is, or three of them actually, one, we don't accept death as a reality. I mean, a lot of times we have some strange images that are portrayed in the media about what death is like and everything else, and it usually be, it ends up being a lot more cruel than most people think it is. And because our body doesn't really want to give up the ghost very quickly. And so it ends up being a little tougher, even in, in the way that we look at it. In the past, it was something we called the familiar death. Uh, people would walk out their front door and there would be a family cemetery. So they would walk out and be reminded day in and day out about that. And, and there are some biopic movies that we have about how familiar death was, whether it's William Wallace or whether it's the, you know, the, the uh, cemetery and in, in, um, um, you know, things like, for example, the uh, John Adams miniseries. Yeah. And, and, and actually, ironically, the cemetery was the center of town mm -hmm. because that was where to gather to actually talk with one another. So um, you go into some of the older communities in Massachusetts, you'll find the cemetery in the middle of town, which is kind of odd in our yeah. world. So, um, you know, it, it's the familiar death. Uh, and, and where we are today is we have kind of a me medicalized, kind of sanitized version of death. Um, now, the hospice movement has probably had the greatest impact on that because it's moved a lot of those services home where the person can die with dignity in their home and that kind of thing. We get closer to views like this, where the dying person is able to kind of give the challenge to encourage people and then they, they, they pass away. And, that's, and that's, that's really more a matter of that. I mean, we, I'm having more conversations, I've had a lot of conversations with parents. They're saying, well, should my child be around somebody who's dying or should they go to a funeral? And, and you know, kids understand death they understand a lot more than we think they do. And, and the, the exposure doesn't hurt them because they, they absorb it at the level that they can. We don't have to modulate that. You know, they, they understand somebody's gone. They're, un, un, you know, they're unavailable and un, inaccessible after death. They understand that. And so, um, so, but they express grief differently than we do you know, because of, of the kind of the temporary nature of life and they haven't had enough experience and they can't anticipate the future and all that kind of stuff. So the second thing is we don't we haven't really been taught how to grieve. We don't have very many clear models about grieving. Um, families oftentimes hide it. Um, and and a lot of times the, the last subject anybody sitting in a church wants to hear about is grief and loss. Because they think they think that it's actually um, they, they think that it's a bummer subject. <laughs> it's a dark subject, when in fact it has more life in it than we think. Uh, because we, we disconnect death from life. 
And when you connect to death with life, then new meaning comes, new sense of purpose comes. Because then, uh, as, as uh, you know, the writers in scripture say, oh, we're our, our, our days are numbered. So we have to think through some of that. So we don't have very many clear models for grieving. And then the last one is, is we don't have, oftentimes, we have no predecessor for our grief. It is that we've never experienced it before. People live longer. Um, and so, you know, I, it's not really a matter of, of anybody's teaching me about that. Um, when I was a kid, my dad died when I was 12, and, and um, it was really the first opportunity, obviously my first opportunity. And the, the lady, I was staying at a friend of my, um, uh, my, well, my friend's house, and his mom, they would drove me back to the house after my mom had broke, broken the news to me that my dad had died. And, and she, she literally was telling me how to grieve. I, I still remember it. I mean, I, I actually put it in my introduction of my book where she was sitting in the car, her, her, her uh, husband was driving us, and she turned around and said, now this is how you handle condolences. This is what grieving looks like. Um, and she was way, way, way out ahead of her, her time because that, you know, that would have been in the 70s that that happened. So, um, <clears throat> and, and we don't have a lot of that. You know, we really don't have a lot of models, and we also don't have a predecessor. I've, I've had many people say, I, what am I supposed to do? I've never, I've never lost anybody before. Mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's a subject that we tend to steer away from because it raises all sorts of theological questions, but those theological questions actually end up being, um, being a vehicle to express hopelessness. It's, they don't really want an answer. No, they don't know that. You know why, and is God cruel, and why they take them away, and all those kinds of things. But still, it, 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 it is the bigger part of it is is I don't know, but I know what hopelessness is like, because of, of or helplessness even more so. So, so um, it, it doesn't have a predecessor. We've never been taught how to grieve, um, and and usually we don't accept the reality of death. <laughs> Got locked up. Sorry about yep. that. I'll save her from herself. <clears throat> um, so that that's the basic realities here. Uh, the the other part is, is like I said, was we really haven't ever, ever been taught how to grieve. Now there there has been um, there has been a um, expansion, I think, of the church kind of embracing support groups and things like that for people that are grieving. Um, that there's an upside and a downside to that. For on the upside, it's a support system for people that have lost somebody that they can interact with and somebody that maybe has been down the road part. The, the downside is is that it, it, it ends up by left us. Um, you know, it, it ends up being the kind of thing where a, a lot of strange notions get kicked around about death, about grieving, about that that can can often be pretty damaging to people when, I, when we, we talk about it. So, um, and I, I already mentioned the idea of no predecessor. So, um, I don't know where our signal went. It does that if oh, you don't does. touch that for a little bit. Oh, it goes asleep. But I know what to do. So. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's great. <clears throat> you have to touch it. And it come back on. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Did you sure. throw her down the audio-visual stuff? No. Oh. Oh. Mine just shut off. Yes, it wondering. shuts off if you don't use your computer often enough. <laughs> I don't know about okay. that room, but I know that that'll happen. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, the matron saint of, uh, I'll end with this quote and we can go ahead and fill our plates. Um, the, kind of the matron saint of grief and grieving and everything else. And the interesting thing about it is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wasn't studying grieving. She was studying dying. Mm -hmm. uh, most of her research was with people that were dying. So what yeah. we've done is we've kind of ported it over to <clears throat> people that are grieving. And, and she made this comment that I thought was kind of fascinating. It's the denial of death that, that partially is responsible for people living empty, purposeless lives. When you live as you you'll as if you'll live forever, it becomes too easy to postpone things you know you must do. That's a remarkable comment from somebody that doesn't come from any particular spiritual point of view, um, and that and that's kind of a, a a key point I think to keep in mind when we're talking about grief and grieving and everything else is people just want to really kind of package it up.
put it away and say it'll be better. Time, you know, time, quote unquote, time heals all wounds. Which, I mean, that phrase just put my teeth on edge um, <laughs> because time, time does nothing <coughs> if I do nothing with it. <laughs> so, yeah. all right, I'll stop there for a minute. You guys can load up your plates, and then I'll keep charging on after that. Awesome. Right. Yeah. Hey, I got a question though. There's really uh, this comment, and, and grief and loss have a way of. Um, revealing things about us and clarifying our vision about how the important things of life mm -hmm. and and that's why I think a lot of people see it like I said it's kind of a dark subject when in fact it actually reveals more about life than we think it does mm -hmm. and, I, and the, a lot of the feedback I've gotten from my students going through and we, I do that winter term is what I was describing um, is that a lot of times they, they, they walk away saying, wow, this, this, this was a lot more uplifting than I thought it would be because grief and loss is, because we disconnect it, then all there is is the sorrow, but then we don't connect it with life and, and how, it, how it comes together. So in light of this, let me show you a short clip. This is, this is out, of, out of the movie Shadowlands. Um, it, it, that tells the story of the love affair between Joy Grisham and uh, C.S. Lewis. And Joy has uh, received the diagnosis that she has bone cancer, mm -hmm. and they never got to have a honeymoon, which is kind of a funny thing about their love affair. She actually proposed to him because she <laughs> wanted to stay in England, and so she was a d'orfoise. It was very kind of scandalous, um, and so they never got a honeymoon. They just kind of jumped into it and ran ran with it. C.S. Lewis was kind of an awkward bachelor and didn't really know how to handle women <laughs> at all. Um, and so they finally get around to having this honeymoon, and they're on a walk, and uh, that's where this scene picks up. And the conversation that they have, I think, is very, is very much this. It reveals the important things, and Joy actually has a bit better grasp of it than C.S. Lewis does. <clears throat> I don't want to be somewhere else anymore. Not waiting for anything new to happen. Not looking around the next corner, no, the next hill. Here now. That's enough. That's your kind of happy, isn't it? Yes. Yes. It's not going to last, Jack. It doesn't spoil it. It makes it real. Let me just say it before this rain stops and we go back. What is that to say? That I'm going to die. And I want to be with you then too. The only way I could do that is if I'm able to talk to you about it now. I manage them. I don't worry about me. No. I think it can be better than that. I think it can be better than just managing. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the pain then is part of the happiness now. she says I think is telling the pain then is part of the happiness now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that I point out is is that we we love to emphasize the good stuff which is understandable I mean we, we avoid pain and, and 
uh, emphasize happiness. The problem is, is that when we emphasize joy but not sorrow, joy has no anchor. It's out of that contrast that we gain a, a, a depth of understanding about life and all that goes with it. And that's why this is such an important subject, really. Um, uh, and, and after joy dies, uh, this, is, this is straight out. I, I mean, a Grief Observed is um, C.S. Lewis's journal, and he wasn't really keen on the idea of having it published. Um, as a matter of fact, it remained unpublished for a long time before his, his fun, son finally said, Let, we need to do this because it's a, it helps people. And, and one of the first comments he makes in this is, meanwhile, where's God? Now remember, this is a theologian, this towering giant of, of uh, apologetics. This is one of the most disquieting symptoms when you're happy, so happy that you're tempted to feel his king claims upon you as an interruption. Uh, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be here so it feels welcome with open arms. But go to him when need is desperate, when all the help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and the sound of bolting, double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. And it, it, it's a profound comment from a man that went, kind of chronicled his journey through grief. Um, and and, and that's, that's kind of the beginning point of it. The, the, another one that I'll just throw up here that is from Henry Now, and he says, we need to remind each other that the cup of sorrow is also the cup of joy, that precisely what causes us sadness can become the fertile ground for gladness. Indeed, we need to be angels for each other and to give each other strength and consolation, because only when we fully realize that the cup of life is not only a cup of sorrow, but also a cup of joy will we, we be able to drink it. And, and, and there are authors like that, like Henry Nouwen and, and Lewis and so forth, that seem to be touching on something that kind of resonates with people's, in people's lives. We just typically don't say it. We just don't talk about it. And, and I think a lot of the, the profound stuff that I end up being most affected by is when people are grieving, not when they're excited and having joyous times. Those are all necessary. They're part of life. But I think it challenges us to kind of deal with the realities of, of what life is really about and why we are here and things like that. So um, in light of all that, instead of kind of going over um, maybe what you're already familiar with, Kubler-Ross's stages, I, um, and, and Warden, Warden is the guy that, that is what, the, what I referred to earlier in the tier model. It's, it's to, to accept the reality of the death, to, to experience the emotions and, and the pain that somebody has, to, to um, adjust their, the world to the person not in it, and then finally reinvesting in life. That, and that model tends to be the closer to the gold standard, what you hear from people dealing with grief, at least therapists and things like that. So, but what, what I, I did a few years back was I, I, I kind of, and a lot of times when I develop these things, it's kind of out of an irritation with, with the way things are. And we tend to think, and that's the problem for a lot of people that are grieving, is we tend to think in very stage linear terms. So I go through this stage and I go through this stage and then once I'm done with this, I'm finally done with that and then finally I can get on with life kind of thing. And so it becomes kind of an objective list of the, I cross these objectives off my list and then I'll finally be done. And, and the one thing I point out over and over again is, is uh, grief, grief is a lot like a, a wound. Um, some people would even liken to it, some authors refer to it as a psychological burn wound. Um, and so if we know it, we, everybody's gotten burned. And you know, even if your pinky finger has gotten burned, it will keep you up all night. Mm -hmm. And so the psychological burn wound idea is essentially how do we go about recovering from a burn wound, a significant one. And most of the time, before we had any kind of, of uh, synthetic skin and all the other kind of high tech stuff that we have today, is essentially they would just scrub the wounds. They would give somebody a huge shot at Demerol, put them into a whirlpool, and then scrub the wounds because the scabs that would form would be an incubator for bacteria that would kill them. So the, the challenge of, of grieving is allowing, allowing a way or finding a way to scrub the wounds. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a lot of times we don't want to do this, obviously. Um, but I think we can do this in community and support with one another to be able to accomplish that um, because we don't naturally head toward that. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is, is my experience with grief 
has not been linear at all. It has been more cyclical, if anything. And so what I thought was, well, surely there's some way that we can capture grieving in a, in a developmentally cyclical way, which is how we develop anyway, okay? You watch kids develop, and their, their, their cognitive development will outpace their physical development. And then the physical development will go, and the cognitive will be slow, or their emotional development. And so what I was searching for was, is there a way that we can think about grief that's developmental in nature, that includes all the elements of, of the warden model uh, of, of tasks, things to accomplish, that are not time-based. Because the minute we start thinking about stages, we start thinking about time. And, and that ult ultimately, I think, kind of ruins the grieving process. And, and so, so what I want to kind of introduce you to is something I call the seasons of our grief. And, and essentially, uh, what occurred to me was because, uh, for most people, okay, Colorado, Midwest, you know, outside of Hawaii and the West Coast and everything else, we live by seasons. You know, we, we know what comes next. You know, there's fall and then there's winter and then there's spring and so forth. And so, it, to me, that makes more sense in terms of understanding grief because we go through a season of grief and then we, we, there are characteristics and things that we have to accomplish during that time. And most of the time, when you even look at a more agrarian society, most of the work that's done is during the spring and the summer. Harvest is fall and then there's a break during winter. And, and so um, and it, it occurred to me that, that maybe we should think about grief in terms of seasons. And every season is not, um, is not kind of delineated by time. Because, I mean, we can be in winter and have a, you know, an Indian summer in it. <laughs> or in spring and we can get 20 inches of snow, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so winter intrudes. And, that, and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, that's pretty much how grief goes. The people that are in the midst of this can, can get hijacked by their emotions. And so, uh, you know, a, pre or a late winter storm comes in, and they thought they were in spring already. And, and so those metaphors kind of work together to, to what I, I developed. And so what I come to is, is I, starting with a, kind of an obvious low-hanging one is winter. You know, and, and it's usually a time when things are dead, People are numb, you know, when people are first going through grief, they don't feel anything. They're, they're kind of automatons almost. They got work to do. They, they have to deal with the, the person's estate or whatever it is and the after effects. And most of the time, that's what people tell you. They're just numb. They don't feel anything at all. And that's why people, most of the time, people can get through funerals pretty easily because they don't feel anything. And, and a lot of times people coming to that funeral say, look at how put together they are. How do they do that? And it's like, wait for about seven weeks. And, and, and usually by that time, the people that care the most about them, or the people that kind of are moved to help, leave. And so at the time that they need them the most is the time that they start feeling the most. And so winter, the key task here is really to accept the reality of the person being gone. And whoever that is. Um, and how do we do that? My, my content, well, the one thing I want to mention, and this is a, a misconception a lot of people have, is that if I say I accept the reality, it means I'm saying it's okay. It's okay that they died. And, and there's, there's got to be some way that we kind of disconnect those two things. Is the acceptance is living in the reality as it is, not a condoning of the way things are. And, and that's, <clears throat> that's one of the things I have people always react to. Is, is when you're saying, we need, you know, you need to find a way to accept the way things are. And they say, no, because that means I'm saying it's okay. And it's like, no, not really. But that's generally how we tend to define things. So the other thing about seasons is seasons have particular tools attached to them. So, you know, when I have snow out here, I don't go out here with a rake. I get, get a snowblower <laughs> or a snow shovel. Um, the same way with fall. I, I'm not getting my snowblower out to move my leaves. So my, my, uh, these, these are always paired in the sense of what's the season, what's the task, and then what are the tools that we need to use for that? And so um, what, what, uh, the, the thing to, that is a threat to the, the acceptance is a good example is David, Second Samuel, when, and when Absalom was killed, and he said, I just wish I could trade places with him, essentially. 
Um, and, and so, and we see lots of portrayals of grief in the good and the bad throughout scripture on, on a regular basis. Um, and so, you know, oh my sons, my son and Absalom, oh would that I have died. How many parents I have talked to who their kids have died and they say, I wish I could have been me. And, and that is, that's a threat to acceptance because I'm still trying to cut a deal. And, and it doesn't get me, and it doesn't have to, but it doesn't get me to the feelings that I might have. So some of the, the, the threat, another threat here is we deny the facts. See, a lot of times when you hear the word denial, people just say, well, it just means I, I don't believe that it's happened. But, but there are at least three different ways that we deny it. First, we deny the facts. We, we tend to mummify. A lot of times when people leave the room as it was at the, at, at the last moment in time. Um, or, or they'll have keep clothes or other things like that. My mom, had, my dad was a World War II vet um, and uh, came through some pretty horrific battles. And she kept his Marine uniforms for a long, long, long time. Um, she did not handle grief very well at all. And, and that, was, that, that was kind of the mummifying thing. The story is told of Queen Victoria when her consort died. And literally, she would, she would have her butler go in, lay out his shaving gear in the morning, and then go back and bundle it up and take it that evening. And, and so there is just a stubborn refusal to live with the reality and keeping things absolutely intact the way they are. Second threat is, uh, to denial is that we deny, we deny the meaning of it. How significant is it? Well, you'll hear people say, well, they weren't that big of a deal to me. I didn't have that close of a relationship. You know, he, he wasn't a good dad anyway. And, and those are denying the significance of it. The wound is still there. The, the wound is still there. But a lot of times with complicated, conflicted relationships, it really makes it easy for people, I think, to, to deny the, the impact that it has on them. So. Um, a lot of times they'll selectively forget, they'll memorialize the person, they'll make them sound better than they are. There's a, there's a lot of things that they do to diminish the significance that it actually has on them. Um, and then a lot of times they'll just rid themselves of any evidence that the person ever existed. So you have, you, you have uh, errors in two directions. On the one hand, you know, we're, we're all in and we're feeling it all, and then the other hand, it's like, no, it never existed. Um, the, the thing that my, uh, my mother-in-law passed away five years ago, my, my father-in-law is just that way. That, that lady that was teaching me was the one that died five years ago. And, and my father-in-law is of the builder generation, and they don't handle that well. Mm -hmm. It was probably within six months, and all evidence of Pat being around was gone completely. And I, I kept saying to him, tap the brakes here, Paul. Like, just bundle it up, put it in a box, put it somewhere until maybe some feelings come back again. Um, and, and that's, but that builder generation had a real struggle with emotions. You know, they, they, they didn't have much of an emotional intelligence. They didn't really have the luxury of it in a lot of ways, and that's really how they would see it. So uh, that we deny the facts of the loss, the meaning of the loss, and then we also deny that death is irreversible. Um, and a lot of times this happens with younger kids, adolescents, they, 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 even though they would say they don't believe in any reincarnation. I, I had one girl actually tell me in the hospital one time, well, you know, if I kill myself, then I'll just come back as a baby and I can do it all over again. And, and we, we have examples of spirit, spiritualism in, this, in the scripture, uh, of Saul's example of losing Samuel, what does he do? He's tried to rid the entire country of mediums and everything else, and he still finds a medium to call up Samuel. And, and so uh, the, the idea that he just says, seek out for me the woman who's a medium so that I can call Samuel back. So it's a denial of what he knows, but the, the, it, a lot of times this is where some of the kind of odd ideas people come up with during their grieving around theology and, and, and spiritualism and things like that. So you'll hear people talk about angels and other things, you know, the person being an angel and, and kind of catching sights, sightings of the person or things like that. And that's kind of, I don't want to believe that death is, is at the end. It's irreversible. There isn't an end, obviously, from a Christian point of view. But um, So what are the tools? I'll, the one thing that I tend to talk a lot about is journaling. And, and journaling is like what I said, is kind of a way to scrub the wound. Um, it is not 
it is not seeking solutions. And, and a lot of times I'll have people actually read Grief Observed and say, look what C.S. Lewis did. I mean, if they have a respect for him or anything like that. Some people don't even know him. But it's like, I've never read anybody be this honest about, about their struggles through grief and so forth. And that's kind of what journaling is all about. It's not so much a, 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 a recording of news. It's more a recording of the internal stuff. And, and sometimes people just have to be trained even in that. I mean, so a lot of my students don't do journaling at all. Um, and, and so I, I literally end up having to teach them how to journal. And, and actually the word journal comes from what we call diurnal. It, it's meant to be daily. And, and so uh, journaling, visiting the grave, uh, looking at old pictures, are all, these are all just examples of tools that we can use during this time. Again, the time is self-defined. It's not externally defined. Um, even if somebody, generally, most people that engage in some of the work that I'm describing, it's 18 months to 24 months that the vast majority of work of grief is done. But that doesn't mean the emotions go away. It doesn't mean the feelings go away at all. A lot of times they won't feel because they're afraid that it, it, either the feelings will get so strong that it'll bowl them over, or that they, they won't feel again, you know, they can't feel it. And so they, they kind of shut it down in order to not have to deal with that. So re revisiting places, self-caring activities. This is where the place I, a lot of times, I'll encourage people to get involved with support groups of some sort. A lot, of, a lot of times churches will do very psychoeducational kinds of groups. So they're teaching people about grief, and then they're trying to pair it with kind of a support group system. I don't, uh, what kind of, how do you guys tend to do it? We have family support classes. Okay. And I'll miss the overcome class. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is the quiet, yeah. my quiet cave stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do have grief share. Yeah, grief oh, share. grief share, yeah. And that, that one's been around for 15 years or something like yep. that. Yeah. And, and the video-based kind of teaching is kind of helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then, but all, you know, a lot of that obviously kind of rests on how effective the leader is and yeah, facilitating, absolutely. you know. That's really kind of the key in a lot of those mm -hmm. things. But support groups are absolutely essential, I think, in this phase. Not for them to participate, just for them to go and listen. That's really about it. Um, and so a lot of times they'll say, well, I don't know what to say. Don't. <laughs> don't. Yeah. Just go and listen. Hear other people's stories and journeys. Mm -hmm. and. And, and that's, that's kind of where a lot of the courage ends up coming up. So, so accepting the reality is kind of the first task. It's part of the season of winter. The next task um, is spring. And, and usually this is where things start feeling again. <laughs> and just like spring, new things blossom. And, <clears throat> and some new perspectives come up. But, but the emotions bubble to the surface during this time. And so the, the beginning point of this is, is what, what am I trying to accomplish? I have to acknowledge the pain that I have and work through it and find some way to process it with safe people in my world that aren't going to try to fix me, kind of like what you were talking about, mm -hmm. who are just going to let me vent and not correct my venting because venting is not absolute. Um, I, I make a distinction when I talk about truth even, as truth in the terms of big T truth, which is absolute truth, universal to everybody, and little t truth, which is unique to people. And if we can find a way to meet people on the little t side of things, or on the horizontal, then we can be, begin, when they're ready, to begin to introduce the big t truth. But if we do it mistimed, then people feel like they've gotten bludgeoned. And, and that's, that's part of the temptation, I think, a lot of times when people start having these, the pain and the feelings that they have. They make statements that are really way out in left field. And, and I think the worst thing people can do is try to correct it. <laughs> because it's, not, it's a moving target. It won't stay that way. And that's really the nature of our response to pain. So working through it, um, the, the, what this means is, is a number of different things. You'll see anger turned outward or inward, yeah. or both. <laughs> uh, what turning outward is, is blaming people that were responsible, what they feel like were responsible for the person's death, nurses, doctors, ambulance drivers, anybody at all. A lot of times this phase is where people tend to take on um, uh, projects or, um, uh, what do I want to say, causes. Because that's, that's how they're channeling their anger and frustration over all that. So outward is one. Inward is a different one where we tend to turn the gun on ourselves. And we end up saying, if only I had, 
if only I had spoken up, then maybe he wouldn't have driven off. Or it may, if only I had done this or that or the other thing. And ultimately, that denies reality and it assumes I have enough power to accomplish something only God can do, really. So the anger turn inward oftentimes looks like depression. And it's during this time where, and, and grief, the, the thing about grief is that a lot of times it can be very mislabeled. I, and I've been in the mental health field for 40 years, and I've seen a lot of people, nobody has asked the simple question, what have you, who have you lost or what have you lost lately? Because a lot of the symptoms we see are related <coughs> to grief, not to clinical depression, for example, or anxiety, or the things that we typically kind of traffic in. And, and that's the problem is that grief is so unique and so kind of specific to the person that how it gets presented, we can get lost in the labeling part of it and not see kind of what needs to be met here somehow. So the anger turned inward. A lot of times you'll have people that'll take the psychological distress of pain and it gets channeled into physical problems. Um, ulcers, for example, or headaches, or sleeplessness and insomnia. And that's usually very typical. Um, and all of those physical symptoms are still very much connected to grief. And, and unfortunately, you know, where a lot of mental health is moving today is pathologizing normal things. And they're doing that with grief now. And, and I have grave, grave concerns about that. Because it's, it's a normal part of being human, is losing people and grieving. And so to turn it into a pathological disorder is a problem, very much of a problem. So, as Kimberly will no doubt tell you, I am, I am, I'm very old school. I have been, been around since DSM-2. So, <laughs> so I've watched this thing grow, this universe grow of disorders, and I don't think it's helped anybody, quite honestly. <clears throat> and so we tend to think pathologically before we think normally, you know, normal, everyday things. So emotional pain and symptoms are mentioned, and avoidance strategies. A lot of times people will just say, I don't want to feel it, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. Um, and and uh, a lot of times people will move away. They'll change the locations, you know, thinking the, you know, they're, they're blind to the fact that they have to take themselves with them. Um, and the location just gets, gets affected by that. So um, some tools that go along with this in terms of spraying, obviously the journaling continues, sorting through belongings and, and making that a slower process than just throwing something in a box and boxing it up and sending it away. It's, it's remembering things. Uh, one of the things that my wife uh, went through after her mom died, and I said, you need to do that, is that she, she, um, she said, I think I'm crazy. And that's what a lot of people feel like when they're going through grief. And so, but she went into her mom's closet and just sat there and just breathed in the perfume that her mom wore. And I said, you should do that. You should take every article of clothing and remember what you go through and remember what you remember of those things. And that was a, a significant part of just her grieving process. So sorting through clothes, dealing with the guilt and, and even through the forgiveness and, and what, we, what we feel like we have. I, I talk to too many people that have lost people that they have hurt them in some way and they haven't dealt with the forgiveness that needs to free them from the person who's already gone. And, and that's a whole other kind of ball of wax to talk about in terms of forgiveness, but, but it, it's an important part of this process as well. A lot of faulty thinking patterns. Maybe this is the appropriate place to look at counseling, short-term counseling, for them to sit down with somebody who's familiar with dealing with grief and, and just, and, and you know, all the time I've spent talking to people with grief, I'm usually saying this is normal. I'm not being anything of any profundity at all. I'm just saying this is normal what people usually face when they're grieving. So um, the support groups continue as well. Where we get to beyond this, uh, other tools, verification of how the grief process, like being told it's normal, allowing some emotional venting and purging. That is not fatal to anyone. Um, now, if they target somebody, obviously it is. But, but as a general rule, most people get really out of, uh, get sideways when they see somebody getting really, really upset. And, and usually the worst thing is crying. And I, I, the, you know, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to and the, the tears start coming. And the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it's like, why? Um, and, and, and when I started my own process, I, I kind of made the commitment to myself that I'm, I'm gonna work myself toward 
I, I refuse to apologize for my tears because my tears are an emblematic aspect of my love for that person. So tears are okay. And uh, victim thinking, some of the miniature challenges that come along with this, sometimes they, they need to kind of keep moving along. You don't pick big, huge things. Um, you, you go along with that. And then we get to summer and the bright, hot sun of summer. And a lot of times the work that has to be done is really adjusting the life without the person in it. And that means even configuring a living room differently, or configuring a room differently, or reclaiming a room, or retasking a room. So um, some of the features here, they become aware of the roles the person played and what they need to, to, to do around that, so, you know, particularly with spouses. You know, the spouse played a particular role, maybe they handled the finances, or they did just the tech in the house, or whatever. And, and they begin to realize, I gotta start learning this stuff myself. And, and this is pretty tough to do. Because why? It's just another reminder that the person's gone. And it's just a reminder of the loss. And that's, that's why I wanna talk about it in terms of a cycle. Because we, we keep going through it again. And they think something's wrong when they go back through it again. It's like, no, 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 no. This is, if we're talking about seasons, we have seasons clashing into each other all the time. This is very normal to feel. And so they kind of get plunged back into winter, you know, temporarily. So the one thing that people can do during this time is they refuse to adapt. And that aborts this process of working through and adjusting to the, to the work that, that's done. So even family members and other people around have to have this kind of um, supportive role, but also empowering role. It's not only supporting them and trying to do the things that they have a tough time doing, but also encouraging them to do other things so that helplessness doesn't kind of lay in and become part of how they see the world. So um, some of the tools, taking courses to develop new skills, um, encouragement from others to, to, um, that, uh, who have lost loved ones, obviously another support group aspect, writing a letter to the loved one to explain the changes. And, and a lot, obviously it's a letter that's not being sent, but it's for us, you know, it's for us to process it. So we get through all of that in summer, and of course we know what's coming, right? The, all of the color of fall, and, and the task here is to withdraw the emotional energy and reinvest it in other relationships. And so the, the color is vivid, and, and, and I, I've had a lot of people say, that uh, it's like I left the gray lands, and that's where Shadowlands comes from. I left the Shadowlands, and now I'm back into where there's light and color and things like that. So they begin to reinvest in relationships. Some of the <clears throat> some of the things that we look at here is is feeling disloyal. A lot of times, kids feel that you know when a parent remarries or because of the spouse has died, and it's like I'm being disloyal to mom or dad and. And, and those sorts of things are really very much a part of that. Again, the fear of I invest and they leave. It's a very easy causal leap to make. Um, so they may, they may end up saying, I just, I'm not gonna love again. No, again, that's a dramatic statement. Um, and usually that draws us into saying, oh, no, 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 that's okay. It's like, no, I get it. <laughs> I get it. I would, I, I, you know, I'm in that boat, I wouldn't do that either. It doesn't make sense, does it? And, and ultimately, giving the freedom to be there gives them the freedom to not be there. And so, um, the, hanging on to the past attachments. Tools here, obviously, are uh, writing a letter of goodbye, continuing to journal, allowing new relationships, all of these things that are really kind of part of the tools of working through. And um, the, the, even at this point, there's a possibility, I think, of developing a more healthy spiritual perspective about it. Up until this point, it's not always easy to do because they, they're still cycling through stuff. So it's when they start investing into new relationships, not too soon, okay? Because I mean, a lot of times men who have lost their wife, they, they rush this process. And, and you know, the average uh, amount of time that men stay single after being married, you guys know, 18 months. Wow. Oh, and women, it's women, it's two to three years. Oh, wow. So, and that's, again, that's a whole nother talk, is yeah. just looking at the differences in gender in terms of how they grieve. So, um, it, it's a very much a part of that. So, 
Um, I wanted to make sure I left some time for, for talking and questions. So I, what I put up here is some of my contact information. This is the, 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 the book that I wrote um, and still is hanging around after 25 years. I don't know how it's done that, but um, yeah, seven, yeah, it's almost 27 years now. So anyway, send it to you guys. Thank you. Yeah. There's plenty on my website. I mean, I, I, I run a blog now and again and keep things lively. Um, and a, a video like this, I'll probably throw it up there as well, just so that other people that are, that are working through. We've connected up with a variety of people with grieving resources and things like that. And, and um, I, I have archives. I was telling Kimberly, I have archives all the way back to 2015 of all my <laughs> lectures. So I have all my grieving, uh, grief and loss classes as well. So. I, I just don't have time a little bit, but I, like you guys, I don't have a lot of time to develop a website. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I get a social media guru, maybe I could do that. But between teaching and grading and uh, surviving, it's, there's not much else. So anyway, I'll stop. Any questions or thoughts or anything? Mm -hmm. I, I love the picture that you kind of drew for us in the beginning of how grief is, or loss is a bird. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that, is, that was really good. How we can help and support others through scrubbing off the scabs, yeah. especially if they're close to us and we're in a position to do it. Yeah, for Some sure. of the action statements that you gave us under each season, would those be scab scrubbing things like the journaling yeah. or the counseling? It's all the part of the process. That's the things sure. that we could kind of encourage or yep. have you thought of this? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes just people reading their journal to you is, is that process. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's whatever we keep locked up in our heads, the minute we put it outside of us, now we're committed to it, and we actually feel it. But as long as it stays locked up in our head, a lot of times we won't feel it. So yeah, it, all of those tools really are um, strategies for, for assistance, for support. And, and you know, I, it, it's always helpful to have a kind of a repertoire that you can give people to, to look at and talk about. Not everything will fit everybody. Sometimes people happen onto their own strategies, you know, and that's even better really, because it, it, it empowers them. Uh, the one thing about losing somebody to death is that we feel very, very helpless. Yeah. I, can't, I couldn't do anything about it. So when they start to buy into this grief process and the work that I have to do is I need to do, great, let me support it in whatever way I can or resource it whatever way I can, so yeah. There was a slide that you had, it might have been one or two back and yeah. that was gonna Anybody go back to that? Sure. I just wanted to see which one it was. <clears throat> but, um, let's see. Uh, oh, go the other way. I'm sorry. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah, yeah, let's too, see. Him. Too soon. That one? Uh, oh. So, Frank Buckroth. Oh, um, <clears throat> hangs on to passage. I, yeah. I didn't understand what you meant by that, so. Well, I mean, to some degree, <clears throat> I mean, one way we do that is we compare the new people in our lives to the person we've lost. And that's oh, hanging on to the attachment. Okay. A lot of the stuff that's written in grief and loss and all the material around it is usually built off of uh, attachment theory. And, and so attachment theory basically looks at strategies that people have to <clears throat> create a bind to people yeah. so that I know who I am and also how, where I fit. So when somebody dies, that's broken, and I stay attached to them. Okay. And, and so I, when I have to, that reinvestment, I've got to withdraw emotional energy and then reinvest it. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's really hard. Because when I withdraw, again, I'm saying, I'm not being loyal, I'm leaving them, you know, I, I'm abandoning them, that kind of stuff. And that's what interferes with that, is that attachment is very, very tough to kind of reconfigure. Um, even in the animal kingdom, I know I, if you've ever seen, Canadian geese are monogamous. And if, one, if a mate dies, what you will usually find is the other mate being there near them, near the dead body. And in the animal kingdom, we call it pining. In humans, we call it grieving, <laughs> and, and that's that, that same thing is true. So that's what I mean by that. Okay. As far as the attachment goes, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. One of the other, no, you get your hand. One of the things that I that um, in dealing with grief and dealing with you know, so I've done a fair amount of funerals, and Pastor Scott has been doing it since. Yeah. 
Um, one of the things that I've noticed has been really, really hard, and I try to help the family understand, and I knew you mm -hmm. covered a little bit, but I'd like to get your advice on it. Yeah. Is whenever I do a funeral, I mean, and I don't usually use this word, but it's the hype. Mm -hmm. It's everything is hype, you know, it's heightened up to that point, and, yep. you know, they're emotionally invested or they're detached, whatever it may be. And I always tell them, I said, you know, right now you're kind of on a high. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and <clears throat> everything's happening, you know, if you get the, you're planning the food and planning who's speaking and whatever. Yep. But then tomorrow, it's like the dust has settled, everything is back to normal again. Yep. How do you encourage families, or how would you encourage maybe Pastor Scott and myself yeah. to be in a place where we really care for the families? I mean, I, I have a plan in my phone whenever I do a funeral. I always, you know, like for the first three months, I contact them every other week. Mm -hmm. And then three to six, it's every month. And then it's just kind of sporadic. Sure. That. Just to let them know that we love them, that we care for them, we pray for them. Yep. But what is the most effective way to really care for the family, maybe in that, that year after? Because they're going to start experiencing anniversary. They're yep. Gonna, their birthday, maybe the day they were married, you know, the day they were whatever. Yep. How do you encourage people in that, that year? Well, I, I think you're on a great track, really. I mean, it, it probably is kind of developing a team of people to, to vary the faces, you know, that, that reach out to the person. And, and having, having them be prepared for all of the aspects, the features that I was talking about. Yeah. So, so that they're not put off by that. And, but the regularity of contact is also permission giving. It gives permission to talk about that stuff rather than necessarily, you know, and check-ins are good, but check-ins typically are fairly temporary and very time limited. Yeah. And, and people, particularly with you being at a role of a pastor, is they know that you're really busy. And so when you check in, they'll regulate more than you will. So you're, you know, you, you engage and you say, I, how you doing? I want to hear. And they say, well, I know that, that he's really busy. I'll take, give him the shortened version of it. And, and so I think the challenge is, is saying, look, <clears throat> why don't you come on in and let's sit down and you tell me how it's been for the last month. What's been the highs? What's been the lows? What have been the questions? And, and, and that gives some continuity to it. And, and I think that's, that may be a way to do that the most effectively. Because what you're calling hype I refer to as numb, okay. and and so they do things that they would if they really felt what they did at month eight, yep. they would never be doing that there, <laughs> because of how much emotions and everything <coughs> going on in, inside of them. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think trying to give some permission to take the time that's necessary, and our society's not real good at that either. You know, I, I you know, what's bereavement time at, at a, at a company you know a week maybe tops and and in sick days obviously I'm going to be more sick than I'm going to have lost but still there's there's not an understanding I think of the long-term impact that grief has and and people don't either you know I'm not I'm not throwing people under the bus but their lives go on and and so it's it's really hard to stay connected you know because we we, we will kind of go into kind of a uh, a, uh, not really a lethargy, but kind of a suspended animation. You know, I, I don't want to do anything because if I move, it just hurts, kind of thing. Totally and, and so, uh, having somebody that gives me permission just to vent and say, "What's been the worst part of this? And what what what's been surprised?" Yeah. You know, and 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 that that tends to, I think, give them permission to move into that and do that. That's why support groups oftentimes help stand in the gap. Mm. But, that, but that's why I also said leaders are really pretty important. Oh, yeah. um, because the leader, if the leader is, is not kind of, uh, far enough ahead on the journey uh, or has, has developed, it, like I said, kind of the healthy perspectives about grief and things like that, then they just perpetuate more distortions around right. them. And that makes it tougher. Awesome. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, would you talk about the, the scrub of the burn? That just blew my mind. Yeah, scrub the burn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That, that, in our that minds, is, that we don't want to do that. Yeah, that's yeah. polar opposite of what we pain. Yeah. But it makes so much sense, and not just the it scrubbing does. the burn part, but it's the scab that yeah. I think was more yeah. mind-blowing right. of me to yeah. think of, oh, well, yeah, when you let things scab over, that's when it festers and gets infected, and you're just basically going to die. Right. And that was just as powerful for me. Thinking and of and how, the, the scrubbing the burn to me right. was... 
you're dealing with something so sensitive, mm -hmm. and yet oh, yeah. you're doing something that we would be told not to do because you don't want to inflict more pain. Right. right. But in a sense, you're doing that to allow this person to grow. Yeah. Right. And that, I'm just, my whole perspective now is just changing. <laughs> it does. Wow. It does change. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that was just mind blowing for me. Yeah. So. And it's helpful because now, when you're in a situation <clears throat> like that, you can just think of that yeah. image. And that's yep. what's going to be most helpful. I think of that because I had a brother that had a really horrible motorcycle mm. accident, and like he had you know, all his whole oh, face wow. was like destroyed, mm -hmm. and he had to scrub it. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> yeah, right. And he's this big, huge, <laughs> tough dude, and he was just in tears, crying. Oh, but man. now you can't even tell. You know, yeah. six, seven years later, you can't even that's tell he was wrong. ever an accident yep. because of you know. Kevin somebody was, you, yeah. yeah so, and somebody well. was kind but tough enough yeah. to do that. But yeah, it's it, horrible yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh to, wow. Yeah. Not and and that's why they that's why they liken it to a burn wound because a burn wound is unique. If you you know if you scrape your knee out there, a scab forms. It'll be sloughed off in a week. Right. Okay? But a burn, that's not the case mm -hmm. because you have such damaged tissue underneath. You have now, to have air. Yeah, carry that carry that metaphor into the emotional realm. Right. And so we want to have a scab over and say, good, it's all good. <laughs> But the funny thing about it is that what the body will do, and what we call it, because the lymphatic system will send all of this, these uh, uh, kind of T cells are running to that site, and they, we call it weeping. It's remarkable. <laughs> and they'll say the wound is weeping, and that's part of the healing. So, I mean, the metaphor just kind of blows up on you when you think further into understanding how that, and that's why they use the burn wound as an example. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. <coughs> well, I'm glad we came. This is good for I, for me yeah. personally. This is really, really good. Let's good. Let's Plus, food was good, too. Yeah. 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 Well, thank no, no, you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.